Hi, Paul. Hello, how are you? Very well, thank you. I'm Alicia Barrett with Binnie's. We are uh, just so pleased to have you on tonight. Nice to meet you, Alicia. Good to be here. Paul, well, it's great to see you, my friend. How are things how in California? Doing? Dr. Dan. <laughs> doctor, doctor. <laughs> well, what I thought would be great today is that uh, numerous people have the wine bottle. So for the presentation, you'll be able to pop that up, walk through the presentation first, and after it's done, we'll reconvene to taste the wines as a, as a panel here. Okay. So shall I just go ahead and share screen and kind of dig in or how do you want to roll then? Well, um, if it's okay, Alicia, should, should we wait another minute or two? Or should yeah, I do we, that? Yeah, we can wait another minute or two. Uh, just let everyone get on here and get settled. Uh, we're now up on Facebook and then I'll let Dan introduce you, Paul, when, when we start Absolutely. here. Yeah. How's weather then, over there while we're waiting? We're, uh, we're hanging in there. Uh, we wish it was probably closer to your climate, but uh, to be honest, we can't complain. We had a kind of a longer season of warm temperatures here through the fall. And so it's, it's all right. We are, we are holding out for a white Christmas, but it is yet to see any snow, which is a little, no, you know, a little concerning. It is, it no, is. No, at this, and you're midway, almost midway into December, well, at least a third of the way in. Yep. We had uh, some cold weather, but just not cold enough. And uh, some good sunshine today it was actually kind of brisk and yeah. Most of the, Impression. yeah, exactly. Most of the Chicagoans would say, we'll take it. <laughs> but uh, I remember a couple of years ago, I think it was 2000 and maybe 18 or 17, we, we didn't have snow until Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. And Ooh. that was, uh, you know, it was right at the last minute. And then it was beautiful. Yeah. You know, there's an advantage growing up along the lower parts of the Great Lakes, because, you know, there's the, uh, the snow belt is kind of the snow effect, you know, the Great Lake effect there is almost guaranteed snow for, for Christmas. You know, Paul, you Dan, mentioned, up, like, I, you know, with five, six feet of snow, sometimes you could, you could hardly dig your way out. Right. Uh, Paul, Dan mentioned where you grew up, and I actually grew up in Western New York as well, um, uh, in a town called Grand Island, just outside of Buffalo. I don't know if... Uh, Hard not to know where Grand Island is. <laughs> Are you sure that's a town? <laughs> yes, um, but yeah, I so I very much- I town, I was just when we were crossing the Grand Island Bridge, you know, so I, I honestly, I didn't know that, but it, it had town status. I just thought it was Grand Island, you crossed the bridge. Uh, yes, I, many people only know it from the, from the freeway there as you cross over to, to get, um, <laughs> you know, to Niagara Falls or wherever you're going, but- So we're, we're uh, probably, uh, you know, high school rivalry through in some sort of sport, basketball. I, what high yeah. school did you go to? We probably didn't play that that far out. I don't. We were, I was new thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. So right right up on Lake Ontario, then correct? Correct. Yeah. Yes. And when did when did you leave that area? Uh, wait. I guess you went uh, to Notre Dame. Well, right? basically, I've been out of the area since I left for. And my university studies yeah. at Notre Dame. So that, yeah, it's been since 70, 71, I think. Okay. Okay. Small so I don't, want to, I don't want to do the math on that, but it's something like <laughs> 50 years coming up crazy. That's if I make it to 2021. Yes. Yes. I, do you have any family still in the area or no? Plenty. Okay. All yeah. Right. Uh, well, you know, when, when you start with so many, it's, uh, because I have that, 10, 10 brothers and you, sisters. Yes, and, you were one of 11. And, yeah. and two sisters. So um, a lot of them are scattered about the country, but there's still a good entourage holding the fort down in New York. Okay. Any other family members in wine? Well, uh, yes. My brother David is developing. Are you familiar with the work that we're doing in the Finger Lakes? Uh, Dan has told me a little bit about it, uh, but definitely not an expert on it. Yes. Well, I'll we'll get you out of Chicago one of these days and <laughs> take you back to your hometown. And then from there, it's just a three hour drive to the Finger Lakes. We're on Seneca near Watkins okay. Glen, just above Watkins Glen on the east. We have a western facing, so that's the east side of the lake. Right. 
and we're probably five minutes out of town if that and so we're up on a pretty steep slope near Hector Falls which as you may know we're just south of Hector Falls is the second largest falls in New York State. In the state. Mm -hmm. But yeah. compared to Niagara is nothing. <laughs> but anyway, that's his claim to fame. Yes. Well, so we that's, we, we've got Riesling going there. In fact, hold on a second. I think, I think Santa's bringing me a Christmas gift this year of some Riesling, is that correct? I do hope, yeah, well, it might be a little early. You know, we're not releasing so soon. So this is, this is it. Can you see that? Yes. The Hillican Hub. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. And is this your first vintage then? Correct, yeah. We're, this gets released, this is the 19 and we'll release it in about three, two or three months. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, we have and then- you might, you might recognize at least some aspects of, the, of New York State in this thing. Like a little bit of this is part of the, taken from the flag or that from the state. That's oh, the state. okay. Yeah, okay. there's just subtle elements that are a little bit modified, but if you're uh, into abstract thinking, you can probably <laughs> <laughs> you do some elements that uh, that, that that represent New York State. Very cool. Um, why don't we start off? I can go ahead and introduce, and then we'll let you take it away. All right, everyone. Well, I just wanted to say thank you tonight for our host, Alicia, and to Benny's Beverage Depot. Um, I've had the privilege of getting to know Alicia through our local tasting group now in Chicago. Gosh, about four or five years. And Alicia, you are absolutely one of the top professionals in Illinois. And this evening truly reflects your passion and ambition. Um, my name is Dan Pilkey. I am the local representative uh, for Paul Hobbs Wines. And tonight we're blessed to have Paul Hobbs live from California. Um, I'll also be in the chat room to kind of stir the pot and to relay any questions. For anyone that isn't familiar with Paul's past, I have a brief history on why tonight is so special. Uh, Paul earned his BS in chemistry from the University of Notre Dame in 1975 and an MS in viticulture enology from UC Davis in 78. Shortly thereafter, he became a member of the enology team at Robert Mondavi and one year later at the behest of Mr. Mondavi, Paul was invited to be a member of the inaugural team of the Opus One, solidifying his place in California wine history. A first trip to Argentina in March 1988 marked the beginning of a South American winemaking career that carries on today with Viña Cobos in Argentina. Paul's often referred as the pioneer of local viticulture and has been instrumental in his role in launching Malbec's rise to fame. Today, Paul's the owner winemaker for Sebastopol's California-based wineries, Paul Hobbs Winery and Cross Barn Winery, as well as his international partnerships with Vigna Cobos in Mendoza, Crocus in Cahors, France, Jacobian Hobbs in Armenia, Alvarados Hobbs from Galicia, Spain. But if it weren't enough, we are soon to debut a return to Paul's native roots in upstate New York with a Riesling called Hillican Hobbs from the Finger Lakes in Lake Seneca. So tonight we have three wines, our Cross Barn Chardonnay, the Paul Hobbs Russian River Pinot Noir, and our Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. So at this point, I am completely in the way of everyone having a great time. So I will turn the evening over to Paul and Alicia. Hey, thank you so much, Dan. I really appreciate those remarks. And Alicia, thank you for making this all possible. It's a great pleasure to be sharing the evening it looks like it's already dark out there in, in central time zone. And we're not far, maybe another, another uh, hour and a half from going the same direction. Um, I've got a screen to share with you. It looks like, uh, let me see if I've got this right though. <laughs> uh, hopefully there we go. And let's see. I'm not quite sure. On the bottom right-hand side or presentation mode is that little uh, marker on the bottom right towards the plus, and, yep, right towards the minus sign. Yeah, so this one slides sorter. Uh, keep going, one more, one this more. This one? That one. How's that? Perfect. Great. Excellent. Well, as has already been uh, mentioned, uh, we do make wine now in a number of corners of the 
of the planet. Uh, home base is here in Napa, Sonoma, where I'm located in what's called, a, or known as West County, Sonoma, in the small town of Sebastopol. So that's where the, our flagship winery is, Paul Hobbs. And Cross Barn is not far away, ironically, and we're going to be talking about the wine, and I'll show you some slides that show you the winery. Ironically, uh, the winery kind of connects me in some way to my childhood uh, experience as a, we were apple farmers primarily, but fruit farmers, orchards, and so on, and along the shores of Lake Ontario in Niagara County, upstate New York, western New York. Uh, and as Dan has mentioned, some of the other places of operation, uh, we have a significant winery today that I began in 1998 in Argentina, Mendoza, called Vina Cobos. And there we produce several brands. And I, rather than probably run down through all these, because I think Dan mentioned them all, Alredos Hobbs in Spain, Carocas, which is a Malbec based from the homeland of Malbec and Coar, France, Southwest France. And of course, our project, Yakubian Hobbs in Armenia, uh, in the southern part of Armenia, in, a, in the valley, or otherwise in English, this would be called Biotstatzor or Dub Valley, Dub Valley. And the newest uh, addition, in fact, I don't know if you're, I'm, since I'm screen sharing, you probably can't see this, but um, we just have the new label here for Hillock and Hobbs out of the Finger Lakes on Seneca Lake. So the first wine up tonight is locally grown fruit from along the Sonoma coast. And so this is our cross barn, a program that I began in the 2000s, first with Cabernet Sauvignon and then expanding it to Sonoma County, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So, um, but before we get to that, just a, a quick photo to show my family roots. And um, basically this is where I grew up. Uh, the cross barn name comes from one of the, this little barn that you can see me trying to catch the cat going over the, the roof of the barn uh, a couple of two or three years ago. Um, this is me as well, my brother Lindsay and my dad. So these are some of my brothers and sisters uh, taken a long time ago in another view of the cross barn. So I thought, well, how appropriate it would be when we finally entered our, and this I was mentioning that actually Sebastopol is California apple country. And so this sort of like, it's ironic that here we have both grapes and apples and they've kind of over the course of a, a century and a half flip flop back and forth as to which was the more important product. So apples at some moment were more important than grapes and then grapes got pulled up particularly during prohibition. Apples uh, then became strong again. And now of course, it's still a very important apple country, but grapes are the predominant agricultural product from the region, apart from probably maybe marijuana. <laughs> I don't know about that as just a guess. At any rate, what you're looking at is a, is a reconditioned and, re and renovated old apple warehouse, because this is the old vacuum dry facilities that made dried apples in Sebastopol and we've taken this building and basically cleaned it, gutted it, and we is built to put a winery inside. So that's what Cross Barn is today. Um, the appellation of Cross Barn that we're both for Pinot Noir and for Chardonnay, today we're tasting Chardonnay, I think it's shown well on this map. Uh, here you have what this sort of lightly grayed out or whitish gray area is the Sonoma Coast subappellation of Sonoma County. And for those of you that are into this kind of detail or, or fact, factoids, uh, there are 19 of these subappellations in Sonoma County. And just while we're here, you can see this is the Maya Camas range, the Napa Valley with Calistoga, St. Helena. Uh, Rutherford would be here, Yonville and Oakville, just in this area and so on. So Napa is just uh, next door. 
but it is separated by this Myocomus range. Uh, there are 19 subappellations of which Sonoma Coast is simply one of those subappellations. And it is a cooler, it's pretty much uh, the coolest subappellation. And I mean that from a temperature point of view, by the way, but <laughs> others might mean it another way. Uh, but climatically speaking, it, it's the coolest of all the Sonoma County, Sonoma County subappellations. For those of you that have traveled out to the area, particularly during the summer months and crossed the Golden Gate Bridge, particularly in the afternoon and saw the, the, the fog sweeping in over the, the mountains and over the bridge, it's like the fog sort of like appears as though it's engulfing everything in its way and it's just streaming in. It's, a, it's an extraordinary sight to watch. That's our air conditioner. It's also our, our humidifier. And the trees that you see in the foreground of this photograph are fed by that, uh, the moisture. And uh, these big trees are firs and, and redwoods among some of the tallest of the world and some of the older trees, uh, certainly in the Americas. Uh, fog plays a, a major role in, in feeding these trees moisture and bathing them in moisture and keeping them, the climate cool. And it works the same way for for grapes such as Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Well, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna get the privilege to talk about the soil here. I don't have a shot of soil uh, in this slide set for you, but I do wanna just step back one moment and talk about soil. And I can do that for those of you familiar with the topography, you see the San Pablo Bay. We'll probably get another look at this in another photo. This is, Tomales Bay, and this is of course the San Andreas Fault running up and then along what's known as the Pacific Rim of Fire. And so here is where the, basically you have the collision of the North American plate, which we're all sitting on. And then when you cross over, now you're on the Pacific plate. So this part of Point Reyes, National Seashore, uh, is actually on another plate. And these two plates are sliding up against each other, bumping up. And actually the North American plate is riding over the top of the Pacific plate. Well, uh, the two of these collisions creates the soil of our region. It's, the soil is actually decomposed sandstone. Uh, the geologists have named it or termed it Gold Ridge because it looks kind of like a yellow gold orange, gold, that kind of color, and it's very uniform. So it's, it's, it was thrown up by volcanic tufts or plumes, and it, there's not much rock in it, but it's well-drained. Uh, on the other hand, it's highly erodible, but it does allow for us to do a dry farming. And that's the big benefit uh, that we can, initially the vineyard would be started with uh, drip irrigation. However, after three or four years, once the roots have been established and the, the vines uh, have enough uh, girth, then uh, we can basically uh, count on winter rains to irrigate our vineyards. Uh, one of the core benefits, I think, not, that can't be said in many other areas, not, not up in Healdsburg or Alexander Valley that you would see up here. Doing that kind of thing in, in Napa is pretty much impossible. Uh, different types of soil and drier climate. Uh, well, let's just take a pause here. And for those of you that have the wine, the Chardonnay, one of the things I, I think is important to explain, I've been making wine now since 1978 with Robert Mondavi, as Dan mentioned. So in those years, our philosophy of winemaking has evolved was quite different, so it's evolved dramatically. Um, in those days, the winemaker maybe viewed oneself as the more you did, the better it was. And today we think quite the opposite. So the less we do in the winery that is, uh, but the guiding is sort of nurturing of the process and following and being vigilant and all that kind of thing and attention to detail are highly important, but it's very easy to over manipulate or over process something. So we do, we've 
we've worked diligently and, and I think with good intent and intent and intelligence to, to, the, to the effect of taking a very soft hand to guide the process. And so uh, while it may seem counterintuitive, uh, that today's winemaking is in fact uh, in the highest and best practice is pretty hands-off and it has very low technology. But I think it reminds me when I was in, um, my head was geared toward being a medical doctor. Uh, you know, you, you learn all this science and so on and so forth. And we learned that of course at Davis and with respect to wine, there's a lot of parallels. But finally, you put that kind of in the background. That's there to kind of, you need that underpinning initially, but as time goes on, the craft or the art side, the intu your intuition experience takes over and you use the science to back up and or make sure that you don't go astray, uh, but it becomes less and less relevant in terms of what we do. So it sometimes comes as a surprise to people how little science we use <laughs> or how little high tech we use. Uh, that doesn't make the process easier, but it does, uh, I think, make it more interesting and more artisanal, more handcrafted. And so that is sort of an overarching philosophy for all the Paul Hobbs wines umbrella. And though Cross Barn is meant to be a, you know, like a satellite, if you will, or it's in its own right, its own thing, uh, not Paul Hobbs, it's made in different ways. It does share some of the basic philosophy. So it's still in the same framework and the same core values that drive Paul Hobbs. And what are those? Well, for the most part, that means uh, just what I said, less is more. And so we don't need to employ much, much technology. So the, this, this wine is made without barrels for the most part. There's only 8% barrels uh, in fermentation. We're show, showcasing the purity of the fruit from cool climate vineyards on these sandy gold rich soils that I mentioned. But we do some malactic fermentation to soften the wine. But basically what we want to do is showcase how beautiful the fruit almost in the purest form can be. I really can't overemphasize that because we do some things quite differently. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead here and just go to this photo that shows night harvesting. So cross barn as, as Paul Hobbs is all night harvested as an example. And that's, you know, like who does that? <laughs> Nobody really, uh, particularly for a brand at this level, is, you know, working at night, uh, picking the vineyard, but it has so many benefits that we do 100% of our harvest for both wineries, for both brands are harvested at night. And qual qualitatively, uh, from an energy point of view, from a, and actually from an impact on our workers, it has proven to be the way to go. So this is where technology, in fact, advancements in technology have allowed us to do things with very low impact. In fact, we have an advertisement out here, this guy advertised that he makes windows and he puts them in so good that you could cover your house with potato chips and not break one. And, and so, we like to kind of say the same thing, you know, that we pick the grapes and we don't break one. You know, it's just, that's really key. The fruit is brought to the winery in pristine condition, just as if we were picking for table grapes. Well, um, let's take a breath here and go back to this slide, which is maybe not as exciting. Um, and maybe, you know, I can also uh, open up for some questions. If anyone has some, I just want to, I don't know how convenient that is through this format, but if anyone has any questions, feel feel free to interject. I think, uh, Dan, you're monitoring the chat room. Yes, I have one for you, Paul. When you were showing the map of Sonoma Coast, there was a great question regarding some of the a, uh, sorry, ABAs and some of the delimited areas that have been created. Um, I know Benny's recently has been a recipient of some of our Gold Rock estate in Sonoma Coast. Um, and the question essentially was, 
What do you feel or how do you feel about the further subdivisions of that AVA in Sonoma Coast? Do you feel that that's a good choice, for instance, to kind of parcel that out and create a little bit more attention to the nuances of that Sonoma Coast area? I do. Yeah, in a nutshell, I think that would it's appropriate because you can see that this, uh, this is our vineyard in the northern part of the Appalachian in Annapolis. Uh, it's a, and that distance as a crow flies from the ocean is roughly five miles. But you have parts of here's Sebastopol, even Santa Rosa that are still in the Appalachian. These are very different soils and also quite different climatically. So I, it's, uh, I think the questioner probably is quite up to speed on what's going on. Um, so they're probably aware that there's a tremendous amount of work being done to kind of make that separation happen. And I think it would be a good thing. Absolutely. But how it will be done is yet to be, you know, yet to be named, but whether it's called the true Sonoma Coast or, or the far west Sonoma Coast or what something of that ilk, I don't know. Well, Paul, I have a question for you. You mentioned this kind of evolution in winemaking that's, uh, that has happened um, arguably across the globe as, as winemakers now are going for kind of a more hands-off approach. Uh, can you share kind of when you think, uh, specifically in California here, kind of what years do you think that kind of, when did that start? And, you know, maybe who kind of led that and was that um, adopted by many early on or did it meet resistance initially? Yeah, that's a really, uh, probably you could write a, a book on that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I began in the 70s and I think at that moment, California was taking the lead on technology and was pretty forward thinking and a rap, it's sort of like a rebel in the sense that it was going against the European precepts of generational, just do what the previous generation did. So it was challenging all the preconceived concepts. And my work at Robert Mondavi for the seven years that I was there was sort of like a mini UC Berkeley. You know, we were constantly experimenting. And when Opus started uh, and the Mouton Rothschild team came in to work uh, with us in the collaboration, uh, there was a there was a significant clash of ideology, uh, which is not that surprising. They just considered their, this approach to be a craft, and the science part of them was in some ways off-putting. Yet Bordeaux does have a very good school of scientific uh, aspect as well. But despite that. Um, there was so much energy at that moment driven toward technology and discovery of new, new techniques and so on and so forth. And that was really truly necessary. That benefited the industry greatly. To give you a small example, oak barrels. Well, in California, we began working with oak barrels in the late 1960s. And it's one of the reasons I got my position with Mondavi is because I did my research on oak extracts under Dr. Singleton at Davis. And so, but how do you close an oak barrel effectively? If you, at the time, everybody was using oak bunks, oak against oak, but it was splitting the bung stave and causing spoilage problems. And then we tried red, red wood and this and that. Well, finally through NASA and the development of the silicon products that they, they now, I mean, I did, I spent years working on this problem. And then one day this thing comes through the door, you know, here's a $5 bung that does the job <laughs> flawlessly and now is adopted worldwide. And, and nobody uses anything different anymore, but it was a big, big, and that's just one example. So, but the change really began, I would say um, mainly in the nineties. I mean, there's some movement in the eighties toward the late eighties to look for, uh, lower tech ways, softer ways. But when I think back uh, in 88, for example, when they went to Argentina, we were already studying indigenous yeast fermentation. And so maybe even in the early days, we were beginning to do the work and some of the leaders 
uh, are names like Helen Turley in California, uh, Larry Hyde would be one, Steve Kistler. Uh, I being just a little bit younger, was sort of the next generation. So I would probably be in more like Marco Bear might follow me, for example, um, by a half generation, something like that. So, it's, but I, I would say there's a number of folks and I'm, I mean, there's others as well that, that you, we can think of. And you know, there's all the, this hippie thing out here in California helped drive this thing. So that was, a, that was another one of the benefits in my opinion, that some of the hippies living in the Redwoods uh, became great, like, I don't know if they would appreciate that I would call them a hippie, but like, um, um, Thatcher Wines, things like that, some of these guys were, were really doing some cool stuff in the woods, you might say, and they were making low tech wines and those were being appreciated by critics. But it really gained a lot of momentum in the last 20 years. Yeah. yeah. At any rate, that's a that's a big question. I've only touched on it. <laughs> well, you you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. So um, why don't we roll roll ahead here? Uh, sorry, I get this thing going in the right direction. And we'll move now to the Paul Hobbs winery. This winery. Uh, Actually, when I started Paul Hobbs Wines in 1991, we're celebrating 30 years next year. I'm glad we didn't choose this year to celebrate 20. We got lucky and didn't start in 1990. We started in 1991, so that all worked out nicely. These buildings were built uh, in 2003. So from 2000 or 1991, the first 11 or 12 years, I made all Paul Hobbs Wines and shared facilities and other people's wineries. Uh, so this is, the this is the complex that you would see. This is our campus. Uh, I'm speaking to you from uh, our offices here. And here are some examples, uh, closer and look where we process fruit. You have Jenny there uh, working on Pinot Noir. So our next wine is a Russian River Pinot Noir. And I wanna talk a bit more about that. But one thing that's, I think, again, it's just the lushness of the natural vegetation with redwoods and firs and that grow to be quite large. And so while it's not any rainfall essentially from May through October, we do get plenty of rain in the winter months. And actually our rainy season is going to begin right about the mid, mid December. In fact, on Saturday starts our rainy season and it's almost like you, know, you would expect in the tropics, except it's cold. We have really cold rains, which is very good for, for the vines. Now we've talked about the harvesting at night. So 100% of Paul Hobbs wines plus uh, cross barn wines are harvested that way. Uh, you've seen berry, berry sorting, of course. And so, but we do most of our work in the vineyard. So while this, looks like a really hands-on and focused project that, you know, that every little defect would be taken out before the, the grape or the berry would go to the, the fermenter. There's actually very few defects at all that even arrive to the winery. That's all very carefully culled and, and uh, grown in such a way that the fruit is pristine. And that's, we find very important for the way that we make our wines. Uh, uh, just a quick comment about how the, I guess you could call it the climate uh, works in California. You have the Great Central Valley here, which is the breadbasket, the world's most important agricultural area, most productive. And uh, this valley during a warm summer day, uh, the, the heat rises, and when that heat uh, goes up, it creates a vacuum. And that vacuum is uh, alleviated by cold air being pulled in. So you can see this fog bank sitting out over the ocean here, that's fog. And as we get later into the afternoon, that fog will be pulled in through the Golden Gate Bridge, the San Pablo Bay, and through a system of rivers and networks through the Delta and into all the way 
uh, the fog can reach the Central Valley. But that's our natural air conditioner and other gaps, either in the mountain range, here you have the Tomales Bay that I mentioned before in the San Andreas Fault. You have the Petaluma Gap, which is like somebody took a rolling pin and pushed down the mountains and, and, and cupped it out. So cold air can flow easily through Bodega Bay, Tomales area, right in this area, through the gap, and out in the San Pablo Bay and also bring cold air up into this part of the valley where we're located near Freestone and Sebastopol. Uh, another shot of it, this is the uh, Russian River Appalachian and you can see the Russian River starts in Mendocino County and winds its way south till it gets to Healdsburg in the Alexander Valley and then it cuts to the west drops a little further again to the south and then goes back out to the west. Well, this river is a depression, of course, that acts as a conduit uh, for cold air. So it's another way cold air can get into these valleys. And that's very important. So there's most of the highest quality plantings are somewhere near, but maybe not too near these cold air channels. Again, you see the fog and how it bays. So, you know, if you look at Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, which heal from the Burgundy region, which is continental, where, where maritime influence, uh, there was always the question, would it be possible to grow high quality Pinot Noir along the coasts of the United States? And now, of course, that's been well established that it, it is, but for many years during my career and many important pundits would write, it's never going to happen. The, these, the Californians and the Oregonians cannot do it. But today, that's not the case at all. In fact, even the Burgundians are now looking at us, and there's a lot more sharing of ideas and so on and so forth. Whereas at one time, uh, they had the wool over our eyes. Uh, there's a lot. There's a story behind that as well, which I'll, you know, I don't think we have really time to delve into tonight. But, but it's an interesting story of how California and Oregon came to rise with Pinot Noir. And some of it has to do with shady tactics, of course. That's what makes every story interesting. So let's go to the Pinot that's in your glass. This is a 2017 vintage. And many of you know that uh, the 2017, in fact, was a brilliant growing season, very moderate, uh, Crop size was moderate, growth was very consistent in the vineyards, and we've had decent rains after five years of drought. So 2017 was the beneficiary of being like the first year coming out of the drought. Um, here, you'll notice that, excuse me, I think this is moving on me. One second. Uh, these are the number of vineyards that were, so this is a blend of vineyards. Uh, some of them are, estate vineyards, which are denoted by the word. And then others are, there's two of them that are not, but they're very good growers. Both of these growers are in the Freestone area and are extremely high quality. So these are all part of what gets blended. So in fact, this is a blend of a number of ind individual vineyards and the best cuts among the top cuts from each of those vineyards. A couple of other little quick factoids on Pinot Noir. Uh, it ferments very quickly. You've all heard how thin skinned it is and that makes it temperamental. Um, that's part of the fun of working with it. As a matter of fact, uh, it's handmade probably more than any other wine that I've made in my career. Pinot Noir requires more of the chef putting his hands and kneading the dough and kind of getting into close physical contact with it. Uh, it ferments so quickly that if you don't do that, you'll miss key moments of what you need to do in the process. So it is essentially, you put your hands and nose and everything else. I mean, you've heard about the winemakers uh, throwing the, the grapes in the vat and tromp, tromp, tromping and all that kind of thing. Well, in a sense, there's something to that, but we do that in a more elegant way. And with Pinot Noir, that's sort of an essential approach. Uh, it would take a bit of explanation as to why it's so different, but again, it ferments quickly, it's thin-skinned, 
So it's cap compresses and it can be very hard. So we, we ferment in very shallow vats. It's just almost the exact opposite ratio of a Cabernet fermenter. So if a Cabernet fermenter is two feet high and one foot wide, just flip it around, you got yourself a Pinot Noir fermenter. Nice and easy. You just want Pinot Noir to be like a shallow vat where you can walk around it and tromp the, the cap and break it up. And the other curious thing with Pinot Noir is that we ferment with, with a whole cluster, meaning there's gonna be some of that fermentation is gonna be intracellular. It's happening within the berry itself because we don't break the berry. So that's an enzymatic fermentation. And, uh, but we finally do break all berries over a period of time. So it's like a little bit of a time-lapse capsule. Uh, it just slowly releases and then we break a few more berries. And by the time, some of them have taken on this new characteristic because of this other form of fermentation. And so that's how we can make it complex, how we make it fresh and how we give it dimension. Well, we used to, and we've actually still do say, uh, when you're making Pinot Noir, you got to sleep with a fermenter. <laughs> do you have a sleeping that bag, Paul, that you, uh, a sleeping bag that you take into the winery there? <laughs> I have done it more than a few times. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. Uh, can I ask real quick on the whole cluster that you mentioned, have you experimented with uh, greater percentages of whole cluster? You know, if, if you just want to share, you know, why you've settled around that 8% number. Yeah, it varies. First of all, it varies year to year. And initially, well, I did my first work in Burgundy in 84 under working with Henri Jaillet. But while I was in Burgundy during that particular visit, I spent time at some other houses, as you can imagine, in Domaine du Jacques and, and also Domaine de la Romanie Conti, more as a visitor and taster than but on, on the inside. And some houses would say, hey, 100% whole cluster was the way to go. And then my particular uh, lead, Henri Jaillet, he was 100% opposed to any whole cluster or STEM inclusion. Here in California, so I, I think it's, it's a stylistic thing. Right. And in this particular case, this wine was made with 8%, but it could have easily been 15 or 20 or even 25. And so that, that's sort of like up to the winemakers as we're making the wine to determine how much whole cluster we want, how much to destem and break and how much to put in this whole cluster. But in fact, that number is growing. Uh, it's growing because we like the complexity and what the whole cluster gives in terms of ageability, layering of the wine and more dimension, more spice notes and some earth notes too. So I think from our perspective, what we're seeing, it's a very beneficial thing. And it does extend the length of the fermentation, which we want, it keeps it cooler. Sure, thank you. Paul, yeah. I had a question here regarding lignification of stems when doing whole cluster. Is there a short version of yes or no, or what you think about lignified stems? Yeah, um, lignifying stems is, uh, was this big, fantasy in a way, it was proved to be a myth in the end. Uh, but we fantasize how to get the stems lignified. And some people, to get them lignified, they de-stem it and then dry the, the stems separately, either artificially or out in the sun, and then add them back to the fermentation. That sort of partly defeats what you're after, but that's a way that you can get that job done. But if you wait to lignification while the the berry is still attached to the stem, the berry will be a raisin. Now we did not know that and we were too busy during the harvest to go see what they were doing in France. And the French would never really answer the question because I asked them many times that question. It's like, well, they like, no, our stems are lignified. Well, I guess it depends on how you, you imagine lignification, but if you think that the stem is brown and is drying up like a bone, if you wait for that, you've got a raisin. So no, our stems are not lignified. Lignification good reason, good reason is, too. is the conversion of 
green tissue to woody tissue. Exactly. My parents usually waited for that to happen on an apple sucker before we got a spank. <laughs> <laughs> we don't dignify just right. <laughs> but we were always good, so we never got spanked, right? Of course not. All right, well, just um, the last aspect here is, well, are, are there any other questions on Pinot Noir, by the way? I don't mean to jump off that so quickly before we move to Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, no, but I have one for you when you get to the cab uh, slide. I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, chime in at the end there. Okay. Does, um, I mean, I really didn't run through the wine itself and what we kind of look for. So I might just take a moment on the Pinot Noir. It's one of my favorite varieties, and I think part of it is because it does so well across many food lines. We you can almost there's just a few foods that Pinot may may not pair so well with. So it's it, it it's very adaptable. It, it as a variety, it, it does not allow other varieties to be blended with it. It 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 just doesn't tolerate that, but when it comes to working it against uh, different types of foods, I mean, it is really tremendously, and what I like about it is kind of difficult to put your finger on its personality, it's sort of this alluring quality to it. Um, here, I'm getting some like black raspberry, dark wild berries. It reminds me of like Northern New York or Michigan wild berries growing. Uh, very intense, some wild cherry too, and cherry pie crust. And bergamot, uh, some orange zest, that kind of thing. And in the mouth, which is I find the most appealing aspect, is the structure, texturally very supple, satiny kind of silky caress of the palate. Um, it's, it's really fine almost like a, a supple chalk or talc pulling on the palate. It's, it's a lovely feeling. I couldn't agree more, Paul. There's this amazing tension texturally in the mouth that um, is so beautiful. Um, very distinctly Pinot Noir and it's uh, kind of deep brambly red fruits. As you mentioned, there is kind of a blue fruit element as well, but uh, yeah, the silky tannins and structure while still being so elegant uh, really well done. Thank you. Well, that's a, what, a glimpse of Pinot Noir, and um, there aren't any further questions. I'm going to segue now to the 2016 Paul Hobbs Cabernet. For many of you are familiar, of course, Cabernet is king in, in Napa. At one time, long before I came to the valley, which was 1977. Uh, there were up to 70 different varieties being grown in Napa. And today it's down to a handful of, let's say 15 different varieties. Cabernet dominates with over 51, 52% of the plantings now in Napa. The Valley, just as a, um, a quick uh, synopsis, is 30 miles in length roughly bounded by, it runs essentially north-south, but it, it arcs to the west as you go north. And you can see this arc. Now this, this uh, map, we've laid it on the page this way, but you can see it's skewed about 30 degrees off north. Uh, so it would, when you get a better sense that it actually rotate this a little about 30 degrees, that it actually does curve out toward the coast. It's capped by a vol volcano at 4,400 feet, Mount St. Helena, and at its base, uh, you have, I, well, as you see, it says down here, San Pablo Bay. So in the far south, today there are 16 sub-appellations, and Carneros was the first one named in 1983 along with Howell Mountain. The most recent sub-appellation is this area right down here in the very, it's, a, it's the base of a caldera, otherwise known as a sunken volcano. And this is the Coombsville district. 
So we have the area known as Up Valley Napa. Here you can see the Yonville Hills. I'll call them out in a moment. Just north of the Yonville Hills, Robert Mondavi Winery, Opus One. And then on your way up St. Helena and all the way north to Calistoga. And so there's 16 sub appellations here from Oak Knoll, Stags Leap District, Yonville in the south. And then as you wend your way up, you have uh, Oakville, Rutherford, St. Helena, et cetera. And then the mountain sub appellations. I've had the privilege uh, over the course of my career, either through, through my six years, seven years of Robert Mondavi, but also consulting as well as my own projects, uh, working for uh, almost, I think all but maybe one or two of the sub appellations of Napa. And even with 40 years of tromping all over the territory, I still feel like there's plenty yet to be learned. Uh, Napa is just full of nooks and crannies. But believe it or not, Sonoma is even more complex. And I think as we get more comfortable uh, and folks migrate out to see new territory, I think they'll be quite enamored with Sonoma because it is more rural. It's more like Burgundy, whereas Napa probably plays a bit more like Bordeaux. Uh, this is another shot taken from Howell Mountain looking Southwest, you can see the fog streaming in through the bay um, here. And then of course, this shot will be taken off the Vaca range. And then on the other side of the valley, here you see the valley. These are the Yonkville Hills that I mentioned earlier. And on the other side of the valley, you have the Mayakamas Mountains, which block cool air uh, from the coast. And a curious thing about Napa is, I mean, in some ways it has characteristics similar to Hawaii where you have all eight of the world's ecosystems in one small group of islands. Um, but Napa has several, and this side of the mountain is much wetter. And over, so you'll have tall firs, redwoods, of that, that, things of that ilk. And so that's one kind of viticulture there. And on the Western side, South facing, you have more oak and scrub oak and more drought resistant plants, but very few tall trees, unless they're in the shadow of a mountain or something to that effect. But on these open slopes, uh, it's mostly smaller, uh, not that they're terribly small, but smaller trees. So that would give you a different kind of viticulture and really have an influence on the fruit itself. Um, here's another, this is the Napa Valley proper. It's not Napa County, which would also take in Lake Berryessa. And this is this year, this is where those big fires started from the, from the um, lightning strikes that occurred on August 16th, 17th. And so this is the area along with another area just north of us here. Uh, those, but those were all fortunately, if you will, mother nature induced ac actions and not arsonists, uh, which we also have plenty of <laughs> fun with the arsonists out here. Uh, so you can see the, the Napa Valley running as such, and the two mountain ranges, and then of course, uh, the Sonoma side here. Well, uh, this is the 2016, and principally the, the Yonville, Coombsville districts make up, but there's also Oakville and some small amounts of, um, well, uh, I'm sorry, yes, Yonville, and just a small amount of Oakville and St. Helena that would be in this blend. Some of those are a small amount of the Bextoffer fruit that I source from Andy. Uh, so the 16 vintage was a very good growing season, pretty nominal in terms of crop yields. Uh, you can see the harvest dates rather uh, on average, what we would typically see as you approach the southern part of the valley, um, maybe just slightly earlier than normal. And again, this was sort of toward the tail end of the drought uh, before, before 2017, got the winter rains of 2016, 2017, ended the drought. Uh, so you might in fact be able to detect some latent drought characteristics in the wine. What do you think, Dan? I think so. I think there's 
um, a good concentration that mother nature did for us that is, you know, it, it, in, in that Cabernet wears very well. So I think it's mm. a natural um, little booster perhaps that gives it a little more of shoulder and spine behind the Cabernet. Yeah. I think it's really got, um, you know, it's just, a, it's still quite youthful and with only four years of age. So oh, this, this is the baby. Yeah, this is truly a baby. And, it's, and so it's still wanting time in the bottle. Although if I were gnawing on a huge uh, ribeye bone, I probably uh, would be happy with it just the way that it is. You're on the, with a lot of Chicagoans here. So whether it's a tomahawk or a porterhouse or ribeye, oh yeah. I'm ready with my tomahawk. In fact, <laughs> don't make me hungry. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it's tannin structure. I, I mean, it's just, it, it has that good grip and grainy graininess that I, I adore. And, uh, you know, in this varietal particular, and Bordeaux also have that. Particularly, I think this reads a bit more like a Pouillac style, if you will. Um, it's quite muscular and, you know, time, of course, depending on, on one's taste. So that will temper and tone and tame those tannins a bit more. But they're, they're already, you can see the promise in them. They're, they're big and they're, they're fat and they're kind of salivating makes my my palate kind of salivate absolutely paul we had a great question here regarding the blend and specifically there's about five percent uh between the cabernet franc and the petite verdo and mm -hmm. when you're doing your assemblage or building the backbone for your final wine what types of um thoughts maybe go through your head with the percentages, whether to do one or two more percentage points of the petite versus a cab franc, for instance. Yeah, you know one of the one of the real joys of of what we do is uh, is is the blending process. And um, you know, I, I've had first of all, I want to say that I've had the privilege of working with some really truly great. Uh, I would say just, you know, extraordinary individuals uh, learning from them in terms of, you know, what to look for and how things might interact. But then at the end of the day, you've got to kind of go and let your own palate guide you, right? And this is true for winemakers, it's true for consumers. So in your mind's eye, you taste the you know, like the core element. And then you say, well, what else would benefit it, if anything? And you've got to be prepared to say nothing would as well. It's not automatic that something added is going to make it better. Sometimes it can confuse, detract, this and that. But it's really uh, just a matter of, I mean, like you look at anything, like, I don't know, maybe you're dressing for the evening and say, well, what am I lacking? You know, I need a little of this or a little of that to just add a little bit of spark, you know, and just, but you, you don't want to overdo that and be gaudy in the same time. So, you know, it's sort of like a question of taste. Are, are you saying that a tie would have been too much tonight? Absolutely. I was thinking a bow tie actually for you, Dan. <laughs> oh, Dan's rocked the bow ties before. Oh, yes. I was a big bow tie in honor of the famous Larry Stone in Chicago for a long time at uh, Charlie Trotter's. It was Mr. Yeah. Bowtie. He so loves good, bow ties, too. Oh, yes. Good heritage here in Chicago with the bow tie. And a lot of great uh, wine psalms and, and, and uh, professionals would do that in honor of him. So keep <laughs> I'm sure if you were listening, you'd like to hear that. No, oh, I hope so. I hope so. He's a great guy. Paul, when you're approaching planting and managing the vineyards, um, are they radically different depending on location and grape variety or is it relatively similar? So for instance, would you plant Pinot more densely than Cab? You know, when you manage those two things between our Pinot and Cabernet, um, how is the approach different or even similar? Yeah, that's a very complex thing. Uh, so it's sort of difficult to put into words. Uh, the approach 
is a is a you know a holistic thing. Your Pinot Noir and Cabernet or you know Cabernet can grow that much more vigorously or less vigorously than another variety. Rootstocks that are available today, because very little of what we plant today is on its own root as a function of phylloxera, as I think most everyone knows. So very few vineyards are a native root. And then, so when you can choose a rootstock to kind of match the soil and vine vigor, and then you have to set that up with exposure and uh, soil type, drainage, a uh, number of factors uh, to set your spacing. Uh, obviously higher density spacings, well, it's obvious to me, uh, are more expensive to farm. So if you're yard by yard or what people call meter by meter uh, spacing, that's gonna be more expensive to farm than two meter by two meter because you have double the number of vines. Uh, but you can lose quality going too tight or too wide. So that's, that is the vineyard in my view and getting that set up right with all these different factors. That's really the, one of the main arts of fine wine making and fine wine growing. Absolutely. So basically what you're saying is it comes down to just experience and uh, more experience. Yes, I mean, there's certainly things that you can study, but I do think it's helpful that you appreciate how uh, land works, how the climate works, all these things, and then have some capability of putting that together as part of the, all into the funnel that finally make up uh, the final planting. So there is no like, hey, out here in California, everything should be planted on a four by four. The, that, I mean, that, I mean, you see sort of that mentality in some parts of the world. And, you know, I remember the first time I started consulting in Uruguay, for example, a gentleman from the Montpellier region of France, had a, a, a viticulturist had come to advise and he gave them like this recipe and because he was French and a big name in viticulture, they all bought, you know, into it and and all they, they all drank the poison so <laughs> so every vineyard in the in the 80s uh let me think was that the yeah this was the 80s and early 90s was converted to this one approach which was a disaster for them and it took them 15 20 years before they realized that was a mistake uh, so we really tailor each site to the variety and also the kind of wine we want to make. Um, the higher quality generally means that we're gonna to go to higher density. But then of course, there's a lot of other factors. The way the vineyard is pruned is the next. I mean, that cannot be overstated the importance of high quality pruning. And there's many choices. And you would think, you know, I just wanna share this with you. You would think uh, like going back to Burgundy Today, you would think, well, they've been doing this for a century, so they don't need to worry about what they're going to, what their next move is. They know what to plant where, they know how to grow Pinot Noir, there's no more controversy. And they're more contentious over how they're doing it today than I remember when I was back there in the, in the early 80s. So the fight goes on. <laughs> Well, Paul, absolutely delicious Cabernet. And yeah, definitely a baby. So much fresh, gorgeous fruit, layers of it for sure, but years and years for this wine um, that can be ahead of it. So yeah, if you, have a, if you want to have a big night with a steak, go ahead and open one up, but uh, lay a few down too. It might even work with a chop, but it's gotta be well marinated. Uh, so with that, if you don't mind, Paul, I did just want to uh, ask just a little bit about your other uh, projects around the world. You do make wine on four continents, I believe now. Uh, so I did just want to ask kind of, you know, generally speaking, kind of what you look for in some of your partnerships. And maybe you can give some examples uh, as to how you got started. I specifically want to briefly touch on your work in Argentina 
you were really such um, a staple in kind of the improvement in quality and winemaking down there. And uh, I think you went down there and is it in the nineties, correct? In Argentina, yeah, maybe 80s. just maybe just tell a little bit of like, what was it like when you first uh, went down? What was the potential you saw that, that caused you to say, yes, I'm gonna invest here and really help um, prosper this, this uh, winemaking country? Yeah, um, yeah, I'd love to share a few minutes um, of what 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 really um, I was at a crossroads in my career. First of all, that's why I went. You know, I worked it for others, and you know, there comes a point in one's life where you just get to this point where are are you going to continue down this path, or are you going to strike off on another path? And I wanted to do some new things, and so. Uh, I ended up in Argentina, but my focus was initially Chile. So in March of 88, is I decided to make a trip down and I had, a, again, a friend of mine from a, 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 a PhD and a professor at the University of Santiago was kind enough to prepare a week long visit for me, seeing a number of the top producers in the Chilean wine scene at the moment. And, uh, you know, I, I, um, I, I also invited uh, another Davis classmate friend, Jorge Catena, the younger brother of Nicholas Catena. And that actually, this little crucible that developed because when I invited this Argentine into Chile, what I didn't realize was that Chile was, and Argentina were still at each other's throat over the Falkland Islands and other things too. Pinochet was still in power. Um, and so by my, taking that action to bring in an Argentine was tantamount to some sort of <laughs> criminal act, I guess. So finally I got thrown out by my host because I couldn't get Catania to go back to Argentina. So he got fed up with me too. And that's how I made it to Argentina. So we drove over the Andes and that's when I, I, I already had a preconceived idea that Argentina was not worth visiting, but then that got shattered as soon as we, we crossed over the Andes and descended into Mendoza and the first vineyard I saw, I felt was better than anything I had seen in terms of soils, tighter planting and so on and so forth. So I was really enchanted, intrigued by what I saw. But then I went out to the Catena winery in the, really in the Eastern part, which is a very warm and sandy soil, salty soils, all kinds of problems and tasted their wines and said, whoa, these are, really some of the worst wines I've ever tasted. <laughs> and then I met Nicolas in Buenos Aires the next day. And well, he kind of somehow talked me into uh, coming back to consult. And so a year later in 89, I did. And that and doing that was a good move because then I saw that there were many other areas that were really interesting. And that's what really hooked me. And that's when I began my collaboration that built the Catena program. And so I worked on as the architect of their program. And during that exercise, um, though Catena was really very much against making a Melbeck, uh, I wasn't very familiar with the variety. So he was, he basically said, don't waste your time with it. It's not gonna get you anywhere. And the French have already proven that because they didn't replant it after phylloxera. And, and, but, but he was actually mistaken. He had misread why the French didn't do it. It was for economic reasons, not for qualitative reasons. At any rate, our first Malbec uh, was proclaimed something like, that's the future of Argentina by some of the writers that we invited to launch Catania in the United States. We brought in a group of wine writers and, and that's what really got that whole thing going down there. But it was scary. To be honest with you, uh, I didn't know it was exciting but it was the Wild West. I mean, in the literal, if you think back to, you know, like uh, Daniel Boone or I don't know, some of the, <laughs> the Cartwrights, things of that thing, it felt like, you know, that at the time. It was truly, Mendoza itself, cosmopolitan town, and outside of Mendoza was very rustic. So it was scary, but it also allowed me the opportunity to start Paul Hobbs. And so it became kind of a fun project. At some point we realized this thing's gonna work. It is crazy to think that it, were, it was just several decades ago that people thought Malbec would not be a thing and to not waste your time. 
and uh, wow, thank you for sharing that. Um, I do think, uh, Dan, do you wanna jump in? Uh, uh, so just so everyone knows, um, Paul's uh, winery down in Mendoza, Vina Cobos, uh, we do carry at Benny's. So if you have not checked out those wines, please do, they're absolutely fantastic. Uh, and Dan, I think we had a question too on the Armenia uh, partnership with Yakubian, which we can bring up. Absolutely. Um... Essentially, we are looking at um, the Ireni Caves, Paul. They said, um, you know, could you describe a little bit about that winery from Armenia? Um, you know, technically, maybe it, it, the oldest um, kind of winemaking cave ever discovered, something that points to some dedicated work with grapes, you know, whether it was to drink or to be buried with in terms of the afterlife and such, who knows? But there's some, some crazy things being discovered down there, no? Yeah, yes. I mean, uh, over there, really, it, and from California, it's 12 hours time zones away. So it's halfway around the world. And uh, Armenia, you know, really, you might wonder, well, how did I even get there? I mean, I don't mean physically how to, how to work it out, but like, why would I go there? And uh, I do want to share one story I was, at some moment I was consulting back, this is 1999, 2000, to Warren Renarski. And so I was a, like a consultant advisor to him on technical issues uh, at his behest. And at, at, at the time that he decided to retire, he, he pulled together a big party for all the, those winemakers that had helped him along the way. And though I was not one of the winemakers, he included me. Well, at any rate, um, Warren gave us each a vial of pips. He, he had, first of all, he had us place our hands into these clay molds. So if you go to Stag's Leap Winery, you're gonna see all the winemakers with their, their paw prints. And, but then in addition, he gave us a silver vial with two pips from Armenia. What, I didn't really have any clue why. You know, it didn't really resonate. But years later, um, I got an invitation to go there to help them. And, but this was actually more of an invitation to do my own thing. So we, I went there, I fell in love with the place. It's mountainous, it's similar to Argentina, but different in the sense that it's colder and harsher as a climate. And the mountains are quite different as well. There's the Arpa Valley that cuts through. And when you talk about the cave, Curiously, you know, we had studied the, we had traveled, it's a small country, so you can get to one corner or the other very quickly, but we had gone to the north, up against the Azerbaijan border, um, and they weren't, you know, most of their neighbors aren't very friendly, so we had guns waved at us, things of that nature, <laughs> the hair-raising moments in the process, uh, but I finally settled on a site to the south, as I mentioned, it's called the Biostad, so our, well, three years after we bought 18 acres of land there, uh, this cave was discovered at the bottom, not, not more than 10 minutes drive from our, from our property. And in fact, from our place, you can look down and see the mouth of the cave. And there uh, from via carbon, it was discovered by UCLA archeologists working with both Russian and Armenian PhDs, and so they discovered this cave, which has proved over time to be a ceremonial cave, and it's been flooded over the eons. You know, you, you know that, of course, Mount Ararat and the, the story of Noah and all this. Well, you can see the, you know, they're still working through the flood zones because there'd be sedimentation and there, but these old amphora have carbon dated to be more than 6,000 years old. So it's the world's oldest known winery. It's really cool. And then, the residues that they're finding inside now have been matched genetically perfectly to the current variety that we're working, the indigenous variety that's known as Arani. And there's a small town with the same name. We don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg in this situation. But all that just is like, you know, you think of Egypt and the, and the history of Egypt, but then you go, this is even tack on another 2000 years. It's an amazing story and you really do have hands all over the world. Uh, thank you for making the wine world a better place. Uh, and thank you for your time tonight. Uh, Dan, I think those were all the questions. Is that 
Is that correct? That is correct. And I, I hope that's in the near future. As a matter of fact, I think we can find the Cubian at Vinny's. I'm going to cross my fingers if we can get it <laughs> in there, as a matter of fact. So that would be great. It's such a unique wine. And it has, as Paul mentioned, just a uh, an incredible story. I think it is so refreshing that even today in 2020, soon to be 21, we are still making leaps and bounds and progress in the wine industry. So it's a very exciting yeah. time to be involved. And I think that's just awesome. And this is a beautiful wine, by the way. It drinks, we, we don't know it's, you know, if it, let, if it gave parentage to Pinot Noir, some other varieties like a Pinot Noir, but it, 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 the berry is quite a bit larger, but it, it reads in the glass a lot like a Pinot Noir. In fact, blinded, I think many people would, would be fooled by what it is, but it has its own personality as well. It's a lot of fun. That's awesome. Lisa, yeah. thank you for having us on. This has been yeah. just a, a, an awesome uh, experience and I hope that we can do more, um, you know, soon, perhaps even in person. So we're yes. gonna, we're gonna fingers crossed here. Yeah, uh, hopefully we can have you here in Chicago, Paul. But uh, until then, we appreciate the time virtually and um, happy holidays to you and your family. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you and very Dan, much. I'll Look see forward you. to the time again. Yeah, travel again. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks all for joining on Zoom and on Facebook. We really appreciate it. Check out our website for um, our future virtual events. Have a good night. Good night, everyone.